guys, Chris from Hockey Tutorial here, and today in this video, we're gonna be looking at something unique. Now, the world as we know it, especially in hockey, custom equipment is something that a lot of players want, and rightfully so. It makes sense to have equipment that's made specifically for yourself, specifically for your needs. We see it with skates, we see it with gloves, and also now in sticks. But one of the most fundamental pieces of equipment, easily the most important piece of equipment on the ice, is gonna be what protects our head. What we're gonna be looking at in this video is the first 3D printed custom helmet that we've ever come across in the field of hockey. We're gonna be sitting down with the co-founder Whitman and going into depth, asking all of the questions that I'm sure a lot of you are gonna to want to know about a 3D custom hockey helmet. Now, the way that we met was a really strange one. We managed to make a connection through email and found out that Whitman was gonna be passing through the UK on holiday. Now, very fortunately, we were both able to find the time to be able to connect here in Southampton, where we're gonna break down as much as we can get into about this helmet to give you guys insight into easily one of the most revolutionary advancements in the protective world for hockey players. Let's get into it. I'm, I'm absolutely dying to see uh, what you have. Uh, and I can't wait to show you, Chris. Yeah. So, behold, the first ever 3D printed helmet. So this is entirely 3D printed. It's made in the US. We make the cage, everything is sourced domestically. It's completely re-engineered, not just for safety, but for the utmost in performance and every dimension. Um, and we can talk about that later, but let me I'll let you uh, take a look at it. Jeez. Yeah, you like that? Oh my goodness. That is light. And it's got a cage on it. And it's got a cage on it. I feel like saying this is probably about the same weight as my helmet, but I have a visor. Oh, that's if, right. If that puts it into perspective. Oh my goodness. And it's one piece. It's a monocoque design. Um, and that's specifically so that we can engineer the maximum amount of performance while keeping the helmet offset nice and tight so that the helmet's not any bigger to provide the level of protection that we want to provide players. Oh my goodness. The inside doesn't look like anything I've ever seen before. No, that was uh, the fourth generation um, internals. And it's nice. It's got a lot of vents as well. I, I don't believe this is one piece. Well, then we're doing our job. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yep. So yeah, we spent a lot of time on the venting. Um, we actually had players on treadmills, um, skating treadmills, so that we could control every aspect of their, their movement and their power output, and then had different helmets on them. And we would put, um, thermistors all across their head to see what the thermal gradient was across their head. And that, that influenced heavily where we put the, the air channels and how we perforated the, um, the inside to allow maximum airflow. Just thought it was ridiculous. Like, as a player on ice, you see kids coming off and they're just sweating bullets. And you're like, oh, how's it possible? You're like literally in the freezing cold and you're sweating. It, it shouldn't, be, shouldn't be that way. So um, yeah, we spend a lot of time on, on every aspect of the, the helmet. I'm, I'm stunned. I've got like 99 questions and that's yeah. exactly what we're gonna go Yeah, no, fantastic, I can't wait, this. I can't wait. I think the first question that I wanted to jump into, and I think it's gonna be one that a lot of our viewers are gonna be wondering as well, is are you okay to shed a bit of insight into your background, how you were able to come up with even, I guess you could say the, the blueprints, the, the idea and be able to execute it. Where does your background come from? Yeah, sure, Chris. Um, first and foremost, like, I think any uh, major endeavor like this takes a, a team. So this is not definitely a, a lone effort and I'm uh, happy to talk about the other individuals that made it happen. Um, for, for me personally, I have an engineering degree uh, from Harvey Mudd. Uh, I actually worked on rocket engines um, in my senior year and then went on to uh, build a bunch of bicycle um, components, um, high-end bicycle components. And, uh, and then spent the last 20 years in software, actually, interestingly enough. And that actually ended up being a lot of the inspiration for how we built this helmet. Um, I think it's a surprise to me that software is actually what allowed us to do something this um, amazing. Um, my team members uh, span the entire range of uh, professional athletes, um, people in the medical community, um, and professional sports that helped advise us in terms of the safety aspects and the, the general trends there. Um, our industrial designer, our helmet designer, is actually from uh, Mike from uh, Bell Giro. Um, he spent 20 years there as the VP of Advanced Concepts and designed all the flagship helmets there. Um, so everything that you see and that you like um, is, is his handiwork. Um, and then my co-founder, Dave Stoudemire, uh, spent his career at Google and, and Sun Microsystems. 
and also built safety systems for nuclear fusion reactors. Um, and so he <laughs> lended a lot of hardware and software expertise uh, uh, as well to make, make this product happen. That's pretty yeah. impressive. Now, I think the biggest question is like, we're seeing a massive trend in hockey of products going from off the shelf, a finished product ready to go, and then you then have to adapt the product to fit the player, yeah. which in some degree does work fairly well, like with baking skates, of course it's not perfect, so now the, the idea, it, it, still, it still baffles me to think that all this time I've been fixated on a custom skate, custom skate, custom gloves, but easily the most important part of your equipment on the ice is, is the helmet. The head is the most important part of the body you want That's to right. protect. That's right. yeah. So how did you make this and why? Like what was the, the kind of you know, light bulb above the head to say that this is something that needs to be introduced? Yeah, yeah. So my, my son plays uh, tier hockey, and when he was 11, uh, his teammate unfortunately got a concussion. And while his parents were taking him to the ER, the rest of us rushed out and bought the most expensive helmets. We just assumed, right, that uh, the most expensive helmet would protect our kids. And we were fairly early in the season, and, and uh, a week later we had a second concussion, a third, fourth. By the end of the season, we had half a dozen concussions on the team. Um, it was clear that the, the, the best helmets um, at that time from the various vendors weren't protecting our kids. Um, one of the kids was medically advised to never play contact sports ever again. And um, at that point, uh, I looked at it and I said, you know, I've got an engineering background. It doesn't seem like the helmets have changed in the last 40 years. They're all based on the same closed cell foam technology. Um, they're different colors every year and whatnot, different names, but it's still the same technology. And I couldn't in good faith, I think, stand by and, and just let that happen, knowing that I could do uh, something much better with my skill set and with the people in my network that I knew that, that could come together to, to build something like this. Um, yeah. Next question, which follows pretty swiftly from that, is how does it compare to what we have now? So w the benefits. Can you tell us about the, the construction of this helmet? What separates it from what we're used to? Yeah. And essentially, what makes it unique and what makes it special? Yeah, no, absolutely. So first, the helmet is 3D printed. Um, I, there's really an intersection of three different technologies here. It's 3D printed. Um, we use a number of machine learning algorithms that allow us to design the internal structure of the helmet. And I actually have some samples I can show you of, of how that looks. And um, then uh, the last piece is around fit, of course, like, uh, and 3D printing. And so the, the intersection of those allows us to produce a helmet that's not just form fitting, uh, personally fit, but we can actually customize every aspect of the helmet. So the obvious ones, frankly, that kids care about is like cosmetics and it's funny, right? Like we, <laughs> in a week we figured out how to do different color helmets and we spent three years on the safety aspect and the thing that got them excited is it can come in blue, right? No, I agree. Uh, the first thing I said, I'm not sure if we actually captured it on film, but the first thing I said to you is red. Right. And I'm, and I'm thinking I'm like yellow, red. And it's like, let's actually focus on, on, on what's groundbreaking right, about it rather right. than how it's gonna make me look Yeah, no, but you know, the, the thing I learned about safety though is that um, the helmet has to be safer and the player has to want to wear it. Um, and if you don't have both of those, uh, our mission is, is unsuccessful. Like we haven't made the world a better place because um, we, we haven't saved any lives, frankly, in doing that. So we spent a lot of time in industrial design and, um, and uh, the 3D printing and the advanced polymers that we use um, in conjunction with a better fitting helmet all each uh, successively like multiply uh, to increase the, the safety um, and they, they all work together to do that. So with the materials that the helmet's made from, I understand that it being able to fit your head better is one of the most critical elements of having a helmet that is, is essentially going to be doing the work of, of trying to protect you as best it can. Yeah. The other materials that you've used, because the first thing I noticed when I looked inside the helmet, it, it doesn't feel like anything I've ever seen. It doesn't look like anything I've ever seen. Of course, it's a helmet, but the weight, the texture, and just the way it sits on your head and the way it feels, all of those are completely different. So how has the materials that you've used to construct this, how, how do they differ from what we see traditionally? Yeah. And what's, what's the significance there? You know, it's the difference between using a wood stick and a carbon fiber stick. Like It's a generational shift. So. Foam um, absorbs sweat, it degrades, um, it smells, and I think most people are at this point are aware of how well or not well it protects against concussions or head trauma. Um, we use an advanced thermal polyurethane. Um, it doesn't absorb sweat. Um, it's easy to clean. Um, the weight you felt for yourself um, ends up being uh, much lighter 
um, for how we constructed it specifically. Um, and then the energy absorption characteristics are off the chart. And not only that, we can tune the energy uh, absorption characteristics very specifically by impact location and actually by, by individual. Um, and I think that's something that's often overlooked is that you buy a helmet off the shelf and it doesn't distinguish whether you're an NHL player who's 220 pounds and can skate 20 kilometers an hour or you're a little mite or Adam who's seven, right? Just learning to skate and you're 40 or 50 pounds and you're falling from, from this height. The impact characteristics are, are completely different. And to think that one helmet could meet both markets is, um, is a serious sub-optimization of, of, of the problem. Uh, and so we've invested a lot, obviously, in, in, in tuning not just the fit, but also the performance parameters um, for the athlete. What do you think in terms of the cost of the helmet? Yeah. How do you think that's going to match up? So, for example, I believe the helmet I'm using right now is about 199 US. Mm -hmm. How is this going to stack up? So let me put you on the spot. How much would you pay um, for something measurably? <laughs> performance, you like you felt it. I mean, I, and this is, I'm always asking the question because it, it, it's, it's how we improve the product, yeah. right? Um, so what, put what, you on the spot. Yeah, what, what would you pay? I, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. But you like that? The interviewer becomes the interviewee. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm cool with that. That's, that's works. I, there isn't a price. If, if, I, if there is a chance that I can, I can get a, a product that is going to better protect me significantly, I don't mean you know, 10%, 20% better. Yeah. I'm talking about a significant difference in, um, in, in my ability to be confident on the ice and, and hopefully not sustain injury. Then there isn't really a, a mark on that. And it's custom. That's kind of like the, the other side of this. It's, it's, it's not only more protective, it's, it's custom. So that's a, a big deal as well. It's, uh, there's, there's no figure for that, in, in my opinion. Yeah, well, that's a good answer. Uh, unfortunately, we do have to put a price on it. And, and so, um, you know, for us, uh, I'll answer it this way, which is I don't, I don't believe safety should be exclusive. Um, and so we were working really hard to drive down the price. Yeah. I will say that this helmet is um, more affordable than any uh, other 3D printed helmet on the market, meaning in football, I know um, Riddell is starting to 3D print um, helmets and uh, our target was uh, well under uh, $1,000. Um, and those helmets, I think, run at about seventeen fifty or eighteen hundred a piece. So we've already cut the price more more in half, mm -hmm. and we will continue to do th do so. Um, and it'll be easier and easier as we scale up our operations. Sure, yeah. that sounds good. Other side of it is um, a, a big one that I'm sure a lot of people that are watching this are going to be wondering is, if you're watching this video, say right now, what is the process to getting one of these helmets? So how do you you know get the head mm. measured? What's the lead time to being able to actually get the helmet in your hands after placing an order on it? Yeah. And when is it going to be available for people to pick up? Sure. Uh, the three questions there. Uh, measuring, um, we have a number of ways we can measure. We found the simplest is actually just to have people uh, use a tape measure um, around the circumference of their head. Um, and the reason is we had uh, 3D scanners and, and the whole lot. Um, we found that it was actually more error prone um, to the end user because you suddenly had to train them on um, a scanning process, a new device. Um, people don't want to necessarily have to go to the store um, to do this. They're busy traveling to the, the next hockey tournament and so forth. Um, but virtually everyone has either a piece of string or a tape measure at home. Uh, and so uh, that we've been play testing that and that, that's actually worked really, really well. It's been really simple, um, surprisingly low tech, like when we're talking about this masterpiece here and you're like, get your measurement with a tape measure, but um, it gives us exactly what we need to, to personalize um, the helmet. Um, in terms of timing, uh, we haven't actually, of course, as you know, officially even launched the company yet. Uh, we have a massive backlog. So the question of when you can get it is really two separate ones. Our goal is to be able to um, take orders and ship within two or three weeks. Uh, right now, because of the back order, it's going to be significantly longer. This, this being custom, that word definitely rings bells in hockey. Everyone likes something to be personalized to them. Yeah. Aside from the fit, what kind of options are you going to be offering in, with customization? Yeah, so um, the fit was the highest priority for us um, because of the performance benefits that we, we discussed. Um, there's a cosmetic um, aspect of it, and we're actually play testing different things, but color is an obvious one. There, there are other things as well, like athlete's number or the, the player number if they want it oh, nice. etched on, nice. um, things like that. No so more you do, yeah, yeah, no more stickers peeling off or trying to put a, a flat sticker on a curved surface. Um, 
So we're, we're really just talking through with different players to understand like what, what would they want um, and what would they need, but you, you kind of get a sense. So fit, um, cosmetic, and then uh, there, there's a personalization of the performance aspect of itself um, with respect to given the size of the player, their weight and everything, we can again tune the, the um, cushioning mechanisms uh, potentially. And that's something we're looking to do um, a little bit longer um, term in terms of uh, we like to collect a lot more data of, of the different player profiles before we start um, doing something like that. So aside from the actual construction of it and the way that the helmet's been designed, the fact that it's printed rather than, it's, it still shocks me seeing an entire hockey helmet as just one fixed piece. It's, yeah. it's, it's epic. I noticed the clips, there's no screws, there's no bolts. Um, and I'm guessing uh, this is something that we touched on previously. Like it's, that is going to be very much accountable for the profile of the helmet and the fact that you don't have foams this thick trying to protect you from screws digging in the side of your head. <laughs> so, so exactly. Everything we do is with the context of does it improve safety, does it improve the experience of the player, and does it make you look better, right? And um, you hit the nail on the mark, <laughs> ironically. Uh, having bolts like on your forehead um, where the impact zones are, um, it doesn't take an engineer or, or a rocket science to figure out that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but actually even just sitting in the locker room, we watched, I believe we watched thousands of players at this point just fussing with the helmets. We had kids where their bolts got rusted, right? And, the, 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 and their cage got stuck or they couldn't pull the cage off or it was loose but they couldn't tighten it because of rust. Like, why would you put a, a steel bolt in an environment that's constantly exposed to water and ice? So we removed all those. It took a lot of um, engineering um, to get it right and, and a lot of patents, but we, um, we feel like the overall experience is, is much better because of it. It's, uh, it's one of those things that I don't think you really appreciate. If, like when you handed it to me the first time, the first thing I picked up on was the weight. But it's when you look at it closely and you look inside and you see how thin the foam is, how like, lo low the profile is, how close it sits to your head, and the fact that there is not a single screw or bolt in it. It's, yeah. Again, it adds to the aesthetic and it's also important because you don't have the risk of that, of that punching through. The amount of times I've had like a bolt pop out and I've not been able to put my visor <laughs> yeah, on. Right, right. It's like little things like that that you're like, how do you get around that? And that leads me on to the next part is, I can see that you have a, a, a pretty unique way of attaching the, the cage to it, which yeah. is, um, so can you only put your cages on it or can you put any cages on it? It's designed for our cage. Um, and the reason is, again, we look at everything from safety, usability, and aesthetics. So the cage we designed from scratch um, to be safer than existing cages um, and to look better. And so if you look at this, the profile of this cage, it's, it's much narrower. Yeah. Um, because we can control all the manufacturing tolerances, you don't have to have a cage that sticks out like a half inch from the head with a giant J clip that kind of loosely holds it in place. Um, the second is by having it lower profile, it actually makes it a lot safer. One, pushing the cage in closer um, actually blurs and, and puts the cage lines out of focus. And so your visibility and your, your uh, depth percent and everything is, is much better. It's just much more comfortable. In addition to it being white on the inside, of course. Um, I didn't even notice that. Yeah. That's, that's, wow, that's thick. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a lot of fun to wow. paint. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> <laughs> worth it. <laughs> totally worth it. Um, the other aspect is, if you think about it as um, you know, the latest research showing rotational accelerations are at least as much responsible as linear accelerations to the brain in causing concussions, if you have a cage that comes out as much as many of the cages do, that is a very long lever arm to pull your head on um, and that creates a lot more torque and a lot more spin, spinning of, of your head and therefore your, your brain. So we actually cut the profile down yeah. while maintaining safe clearances, of course, um, we also built the way we built the cage it has more clearances for managing the clips. It's lighter. Um, we use a special steel that uh, also helps kind of attenuate the energy um, impacts from pucks. Um, a lot of the testing is around the helmet. For us, that's the minimum bar. If you watch uh, youth hockey at all, you'll see that most of the impacts actually are on the cage. So the cage itself has to be designed with safety in mind and it has to work as an integrated system. Because otherwise, you know, we can't control for what other vendor cages will do. I see. No. That Sorry, it's a long-winded question, but it's something that I think is, is frequently overlooked in the. Oh, industry. for sure. Yeah. It, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And um, with the, the the unique clips that you have on the sides, yeah. uh, how do they work? You know, fastening in a cage versus putting a visor on. How how is that going to play out? Yeah. So 
Um, right now we have two models that we sell. One is um, with a cage and one is what we call like the coach's edition where you don't have a cage so the clips are basically removed. Um, we don't actually have a visor edition yet um, and it's predominantly because the market we're focusing on is youth and uh, in the US anyway, North America, um, the only people who are allowed to use visors are NHL players and then some beer leagues if they look the other way. But technically, <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not supposed to be used. So we focus on those two markets first and then we'll introduce a, a visor uh, market later. Yeah. Um, and it would just have a, a, a standard pattern. We're actually looking whether we would adapt to existing visors or we feel like we can improve the safety of the visors as well and, and make our own. That's so, going to be interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things we noticed watching players was that uh, a lot of younger players particularly were having difficulty managing their straps especially if they had their hockey gloves on already. Uh, so we're using a magnetic strapping mechanism. It holds 100 pounds of force, um, but takes just a feather to pull it off and automatically snaps right back into place. Mm. I want to go more. There's, yeah. there's so many other questions that I have, but I think it would uh, be unfair until we're actually able to, one thing I'm dying to do is put, a, a, I guess you could say, um, household manufacturing name helmet next to it that has a cage on it yeah. and us do a very very nice comparison being able to see the differences between the two because i think that's where a lot of this is going to come to light in in seeing the, the changes and adjustments no, no, that's made. fair we don't like making other people look bad it's just not polite <laughs> but that <laughs> that's what i'm looking forward to you can't even keep it in oh my goodness but um <laughs> that's what i'm looking forward to doing because i think in terms of being able to relay something onto the camera it, sure. It's nice when we get some nice close-ups and we're able to literally do split screens and you can see the differences between them. So we're going to save the rest of the questions for that. But what I wanted to do at this point is ask, what questions do you have? Leave them down below in the comment section and we can incorporate them into the next video that we do. Because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions about what this device is going to be able to do. Uh, but from here on, just stay tuned. The links will be down below if you want more information. A big thank you to you, Whitman, for coming all the way down here from San Francisco, taking some time out of your personal uh, journey over here to a holiday you're on, Rob? Uh, technically a holiday, but always working, yeah. I appreciate that. It's been an absolute hey, pleasure. Thanks, Chris. And I'm looking forward to sharing more insight on this insane helmet. Fantastic. Uh, a hex structure, which is a space saving. You can see there's like variable density. It's a little bit tighter in some places, yeah. loose in others. You, you can see that um, there's aspects of it that are um, a little bit softer and a little bit harder. Um,